Hi, everyone. My name is Nathan Hill. Uh, I want to wish you a good afternoon. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us for the first uh, Next After webinar of the year. Uh, we're excited to have you. We're going to be talking about um, a bunch of different stuff today, but all uh, around the same idea of ideas that we tested last year in 2018 uh, that are proven and essential strategies for you to use in your fundraising in 2019. So we're going to cover a bunch of ideas uh, across the spectrum of online fundraising. Hopefully you walk away with a bunch of practical uh, opportunities uh, that you can start testing this afternoon. Uh, before we jump into uh, the webinar itself, there's a few housekeeping things I want to go over. Uh, first of all, we have uh, pretty recently just launched some, some new online fundraising certification training. Uh, we have three core workshops. One is on email fundraising, one's on donation and landing pages. One is on acquiring new donors using content marketing uh, through Facebook advertising and different ad channels. Um, they're really cool. They're really in-depth. Uh, you can find out more about those at nextafter.com slash training. Brady will share a little bit more about those, but we've got some really cool ones coming up uh, hosted at our office here in Plano, Texas. We've got one in Madrid, Spain, if that's where you're tuning in from. We've got some uh, up in Canada, and we're, we're booking those around the country. So uh, check that out and, and come to one of those. Uh, they're super cool. We also have a uh, conference coming up in September, the NIO Summit, the Nonprofit Innovation and Optimization Summit. Uh, over two days in Denver, Colorado at the Ellie Calkins Theater, we're going to bring in, I believe, 16 plus speakers. We'll have fi over 500 nonprofit fundraisers coming in to, to learn about testing, optimization, how you can grow your marketing, grow your fundraising with tested, proven ideas. Uh, that will really help you uh, increase your revenue and increase your impact. Plus, it's super, super fun. Uh, lots of great networking events, parties. Last year, we had a band come in. I think we might do the same thing this year. So it's going to be super fun on top of all the learnings you get. So you can check out more and get tickets at niosummit.com. Again, that's niosummit.com. So I encourage you to check that out. And then for the webinar today, there's a few things I want you to know. We are recording... Uh, this webinar. So later this evening, we'll send you an email with the video recording as well as the slide deck. So you can watch that back. You can share it with your teammates or other coworkers and just watch it back and get some new ideas. Uh, we'll also send you links again to the slide deck and other resources that Brady goes through today. And then finally, uh, we will have some time for Q&A at the end. I know Brady's got a bunch he's going to try to get through, uh, but we're going to try to save some time. So all along the way today, uh, you can send in your comments and questions in the chat pane on the right side of your screen, or if you're on a mobile device, it should be right below the video player. So just use the chat window to send in your questions whenever they pop into your head. I'll be watching those and going through those during the webinar, uh, keeping track of ones that we, uh, we can answer, and we will get to as many of those as we possibly can afterwards. And so without further ado, I want to turn things over to Brady Josephson, our resident uh, Canadian optimization expert. He's our VP of innovation and optimization. And uh, he's really been with us for a full year now. And he's been watching and observing all the tests that we've been running over the past year and has really pulled out some super cool ideas for you. So again, without further ado, turn it over to Brady. Thanks, Nathan. And thank you, everyone, for taking some time out of your day to uh come and spend it with us. Uh, hopefully you'll walk away with a bunch of useful things to help grow your fundraising. I do have a ton to cover, so I'm going to just dive right into it. So today, uh, the this kind of story or the idea around this um, comes from when I was a little boy. Uh, this is me. Check out that sweet, sweet, sweet mullet. Uh, I grew up in a town called uh, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. So it was in North Central Saskatchewan. And if you're wondering if uh, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan or Northern Saskatchewan is cold, uh, the answer is absolutely. Uh, so actually on this day, January 30th, 1990 in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, the high in Fahrenheit was minus 20. So that's for you Americans. And then for literally the rest of the world to use the Celsius, it was minus 29. So that was the high. I know we're going through a polar vortex right now in the Midwest. If if that's where you are, this is like living in a polar vortex. It was so cold. It's actually what meteorologists call freaking freezing. It's a technical term there. And uh, the downside was that it was so cold. The upside was we'd get to see beautiful uh, skies, the northern lights. We'd see them for weeks on end. Uh, that's not my actual house, just to clarify, but we would see skies like that. So I think a combination between it being like really freaking freezing and having these beautiful skies, my parents wisely decided to invest in a hot tub. So we'd have these family meetings in this hot tub. And uh, at the end of the year, kind of between Christmas and New Year, 
we would always have this kind of recap. We'd look back on the year that was highlights, lowlights, what happened. And then we look ahead to the year that was coming. What are we looking forward to? What are we excited about? And that's kind of what this webinar is supposed to be. I've been at Next After for a year and I'm going to try <laughs> and summarize some of the, the most impactful, easier optimizations that you can do today, tomorrow, and all this year. So that's where the 10 strategies comes from. And then through that, uh, I'll also kind of explain some of the underlying concepts. Uh, I think there's 25 different ideas or experiments for you to try and then a bunch of free resources uh, as well. Because I'm just going to scrape the surface or scratch the surface here and then I'll point you in the direction for more stuff. I'll highlight some things coming up and then we'll take questions. So just to build on what Nathan said, don't worry about links and slides, resources, they're coming out. Do focus on writing things down, ideas, questions, got to get milk, whatever it is, write it down. Helps you remember, helps you take your new information and, information. and please, please, please ask questions chat pane, my email, or on Twitter. If we don't get to it today live, uh, we'll be sure to email you and, and get back to you that way. All right, so, uh, and just a reminder, we'll send you these links and this list. So you've got some of these uh, resources coming at you. So there we go. So let's get into these 10 essential strategies to help you grow fundraising in 2019. I'm gonna start a little bit more conceptual and then we'll get a little bit more specific. So first here is keep it simple by focusing on your key FCORM metrics. So FCORM, the flux capacitor of online revenue maximization. We are not only nerds around Next After, but we're also generally children of the 80s. So shout out to uh, Back to the Future here. But the three key FCOR metrics are traffic, conversion rate, and average gift. If you actually multiply those three metrics together, you get revenue. Therefore, the strategic framework for how do we grow online revenue is how do we get more traffic? Uh, how do we get more of the right people to show up to our website? Uh, for traffic, think clicks clicking an email, clicking an ad, they're visiting your website. Once they're there, how do you increase conversion rate? How do you get people to say yes? Think completions, form completions, donation completions. And then how do you increase average gift? This is how do you get people to say heck yes and think cash. So basically, how do you get more traffic? How do you get more conversion rate? How do you get more average gift? The world of digital can be super complex. And especially when it comes to numbers, there's tons going on. But the key concept here is just ask yourself, will this help us get more traffic? Will this help us get more conversions? And will this help us get a higher average gift? If the answer is no, maybe you don't do it. If the answer is yes, maybe you do. And particularly when you get into more testing and optimization, something we'll talk about, uh, these are three great metrics. Uh, I'm running an experiment to help me get more traffic or get more conversions or increase average gift. And you can orient all your tests and experiments around these three key variables, which we know can help increase online revenue. So a free resource here, if you're wondering like, what are my FCOR metrics and how am I doing? We actually have a tool for that. So we're actually gonna be building a new benchmark around these three core metrics. And uh, you can go to nextafter.com slash benchmark. This is live today. We will send out an email later as well. But basically you put in your name, your org, and you give us those, uh, how much website traffic you get, the number of online donations and your average online gift. We'll calculate it. Once we get enough other organizations participating, we'll produce a study. You'll get a free copy and see how you compare it to other people in these three key areas. So simplify with your FCOR metrics. That's number one. All right, number two, think of your donor funnel as a donor mountain. Now, if you've ever read any of our stuff or attended any of our webinars or gone to any of our courses, you've probably heard of the donor mountain. <clears throat> I still think it's one of the most important, valuable things when it comes to online fundraising. So I'm going to cover it again here briefly because it does set the stage for other strategies. So this is how we look at the traditional uh, online donor funnel, right? We, we're trying to move from interest to involvement to investment. We kind of throw traffic and people at the top of this funnel, we kind of like rattle a few trees, try a few things, and then they come down the other side as donors and then eventually maybe advocates. But when we actually dig into the conversion rates by these channels like email, website, or donation page, we see that we're only converting like 0.06% of emails, 1.1% of website visitors, or 17% of donation page. These are people who click donate or are visiting a donation page with, in theory, the intent to give, and they're only completing at a 17% rate. Or flip the other way, we have an 83%, 98.9 or 99.94% failure rate. It's not very good, but this also means that there's a huge opportunity. So instead of thinking of it as like a donor funnel where kind of gravity is pulling people down to take these actions and work for you, uh, we think we need to start thinking about it more like a donor mountain where gravity is actually working against donors. People don't wake up in the morning and say, I wanna give my money away today. I just need to find a place. We have to work a little bit harder to actually pull people up the donor mountain. 
And so when we look at how people interact with you and your organization, whether it's say, should I sign up for this email? Should I open this email? Should I read this email? Should I click this email now to a donation page? Should I read this? How much should I give? Is my information secure? All throughout this process, they're making these little micro decisions and saying like, should I or shouldn't I? And the main tool you have at your disposal to help pull people up the donor mountain is your message. Your message is what can communicate at each and every step if there's more value in what they're about to do or if there's kind of more cost because there are costs associated with actually giving money, but there's also costs associated in time and friction and information and security. So you're trying to communicate is it more value or more costs. And it's at each and every stage that people say, yes, if not, then game over, <laughs> start again. But if you can get enough little micro decisions, yes, 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 all the way, it leads to a donation. The key concept here, one of the things I love about um, the Donor Mountain as it applies to online fundraising is that conversion doesn't happen at one step. It happens at each and every step. Just because they click donate from an email doesn't mean job done. Even that they've entered their credit card information on your donation page, it's still not job done. And this is where we can find all these little opportunities to do experiments and micro optimizations to increase donations and online revenue. So conversion doesn't happen at one step, it happens at every step. And if you're interested in like, well, what's my conversion data? And you want to go a level deeper than the three app core metrics. Uh, we're also, we also built a tool that will plug in directly to your Google Analytics. So you just kind of like tie it into this tool. It'll suck it in and spit out this beautiful report. <clears throat> so it will have your F core metrics in there, but then it dives more into direct traffic sources, digital engagement, conversion rates by source, uh, email conversion, email engagement, organic search. It really dives uh, uh, quite a few levels deep based on what's actually going on. And then you can also see how you compare it to organizations in your vertical or in your size. So that's kind of a cool tool to go a little bit deeper and put some context around kind of the micro optimizations that are possible or how you're kind of doing. And that's where you can get it or you can just start at that slash benchmark report. So now those are kind of like higher level and a little bit more kind of theoretical. I think they're still important. Hopefully they're important to you. But now I'm gonna get a little bit more practical uh, unlike Morpheus's glasses here from uh, the matrix. All right, so number three, use more copy or text in your emails and on your landing pages. Or if I take a little bit of my own advice, use more copy and text in your emails and on your landing pages to more clearly communicate your value proposition so people know what you're asking them to do and why. That's probably a more accurate headline about what I'm about to tell you. And it, uh, let's look at some experiments where we actually did this. So here's one, uh, how increasing the force of value proposition affects email acquisition. This, we're looking to collect emails on the left on the control. You have a pretty classic newsletter, sign up for email updates and then form. And on the right, the treatment here, all we did was add kind of two sentences, get exclusive access to breaking campus reform stories as they happen, sign up below and we'll keep you in the loop. Two extra sentences, change the headline, helped increase conversion rate 28%. 28% more emails with two extra sentences just by adding a little bit of extra copy really, really powerful. Now, one of the advantages of being in the seat that I'm in where we get to do these research studies is we get to see what organizations are doing. And so we did a study in Canada with 152 Canadian charities and we looked, well, how are they communicating why we should sign up for email? 68% of organizations use less than a sentence. So we saw stuff like this. Join, new, join our newsletter. Why? Why should I join this newsletter? Unless I really want more emails in my inbox, you're not telling me anything about why I should join or get your newsletter. Or what about this kind of a cool form right at the top, receive our email updates. Why? Why would you want to get this unless you absolutely love this organization or you just are so desperate to get more emails? There's nothing being communicated in terms of why someone should get this. So an idea to try, it sounds simple, but use more copy to communicate why someone should sign up to get your emails in the first place. This kind of principle can be applied to email copy as well. So here's one of our more extreme experiments uh, where on the left, we have kind of the control email on the right, we have the treatment. So on the control, you can see it's pretty long. It's actually about 550 words, but you may notice by how small and thin <laughs> that treatment is, it's 2,200 words uh, in an email. Helped increase donations 106%. Not clicks, not open rate. The goal is donations. That's the metric we're going after. And by having 2,200 words of copy, in this case, we were able to increase donations 106%. Again, when we receive all these emails from organizations, we're looking at, is this, is this, am I compelled to click, which is the next step kind of up the donor mountain. And 56% of the time, there wasn't really anything in there that was really compelling me 
or us to go on and make a donation. Like here's an example. If you can read some of the copy there, it's basically we're a nonprofit. We need help to continue offering research and articles. Will you please donate or browse subscription products? Do you know why you should do that? Do you know what you'd get or what the value is or what the impact of your gift is a contribution? No, unless you've made up your mind to give, there's nothing there for you. Or something like this, where it's asking you to donate aeroplan miles, it's really, really focused on the miles. Here's your miles, here you get the miles. It starts scratching the surface a little bit as to why the miles actually help the organization. But as a donor, they don't really care about miles. They care about, in this case, the environment. So how, how will my aeroplan miles donation help save the environment? Start with that and then let me know why my aeroplan miles, miles can help. So think about how you can use copy and more of it to communicate why someone should give to you in your email so that they're compelled to click and eventually compelled to give. Or even on your donation page. Here's one of my favorite experiments. Uh, we use it quite a lot because it's so clear and simple on the left. We've got one line and some social sharing. And then on the right, there's about four short paragraphs with a kind of headline just explaining why someone should gift and what the impact of their donation would be. Helps increase donations 150.2%. And again, people have already clicked donation, job not done. We still need to communicate why someone should give. When we looked at this with 152 Canadian charities, we did see that 64% used more than one sentence. But if we actually took this to be more than two sentences or more than three sentences, that number would have gone down to about 20 or 30% or even less organizations. Very, very few organizations are using uh, copy to explain why a donation is needed. We see this, why should you give to this organization? Or something like this. This is actually from a different study, the nonprofit recurring benchmark. You click donate and then this pops up. Nice and simple. Nothing about the value and why you should actually give to this organization. So how can you use more copy to communicate why someone should give on your donation page? So the key concept here, longer is better. No, that is not the key concept at all. It's not the length that matters. It's how you use it. Or maybe more correct. <laughs> it's about the value proposition. If you actually look at these experiments that I just referenced, we're not actually testing length. Value proposition, value proposition, value proposition. We're actually testing the value proposition. We have to use text to communicate the value proposition, but it's all about the value proposition. And again, that's your message to pull people up that donor mountain. So the value proposition question is this, why should I with you rather than another organization or not at all? So why should I sign up with you? Uh, why should I open and click you? And why should I give to you rather than another organization or not at all? That's the, an that's the question you're trying to answer in the mind of the donor for email acquisition in your emails and on your donation pages. And it's hard to do that without using copy or text. So how can you actually go about answering the value proposition question? Well, there's four, more, four main ways. There's appeal, do they want it? There's exclusivity, can they get it anywhere else? Do they understand it? That's clarity and do they believe you? It's credibility. Uh, again, I'm not gonna dive into all of these, but in, in looking at our experiments and um, what I see in terms of what's easiest and what's most powerful, clarity is the one that jumps out. It's, it's the easier one that's in your control to just be more clear with what uh, you're asking someone to do to help increase conversion. Again, if you look at these experiments, it's not about length, it's about value proposition. It's really about clarity. What do you get when you sign up? What happens when you give? What happens when you give? That's being more clearly communicated. The additional copy is more clear about what you're being asked to do. So as you're thinking about expanding copy, it's not just about length. How do you answer that question? And how specifically uh, can you be more clear with what you're saying and what you're asking people to do? We like to say clarity trumps persuasion. Just be clear with what you're asking and what you're saying, and it should help. Now, again, I just scratched the surface on value proposition, but the good news is we have a free, robust study. I think there was 137 organizations in this, uh, in this uh, study. And we asked all those organizations, online, phone, uh, and social, and on their donation page, why should I give to you rather than another organization or not at all? And then we kind of benchmarked them. So you can learn a lot more about value proposition, those four ways to answer, and what other organizations are doing in that study. But the key there, again, it's not about length. It's how you use it. It's answering the value proposition question. And clarity trumps persuasion. But then what about your donation asks specifically? So here's an experiment where increasing the clarity affects donor conversion rate. So this is CaringBridge. They have uh, health journey sites uh, for people to raise funds as they're experiencing these different health journeys. So here's the control, the kind of standard message that they use uh, on these microsites. Then here is the treatment one and treatment two, uh, starting to talk a little bit more about how CaringBridge, the organization needs those donations. We saw a small lift in each case, seven, 8%. 
uh, neither of which were statistically significant. But then this is a multivariable test. So then we also have treatment three and treatment four. And you can see here, the message starts to go, a $30 donation does, and a $30 donation does. And the second one actually anchors, will you help support for a year? And once we started articulating kind of this tangible impact or extra clear, we saw a 64% or a 78% increase in donations. Or here's another example of communicating the specific kind of impact can affect donor conversion. So this was an online course confirmation page where we move into an instant donation ask, something I'll talk a little bit more. But this was about a marriage ministry course. And so after saying, thank you, you're enrolled in the course, it kind of goes into this value proposition of why you should make a gift. And then it has this anchor or impact statement at the end, your gift of $50 will bring, uh, help us alert 7,000 more people about this course versus your gift of $50 will allow 36 more couples to sign up for this online course. By framing the kind of impact or tangibility in this way that's a lot more relevant to who just signed up for this course, helped increase conversion rate 98%. So it's not just being specific and tangible, but you can optimize that to be more specific and tangible to the person that you're talking to. In this case, how many more couples will be able to take this course? So there's clarity in your messaging, but when it comes to the ask, how can you be more tangible and specific with that impact of someone's donation? Something for you to try. Uh, I learned a lot about tangibility and generosity from this book called The Science of Giving. The book is not free <laughs> by any means, but there is a chapter on tangibility and generosity, which you can access for free at that link, bit.ly uh, slash tangibility dash and dash generosity. You can read more about uh, how tangibility really affects generosity. So that's something for you to try uh, as well. Number four here, we're cruising. I think we're going to be all right for some questions. So uh, send emails from real people. Uh, to real people. So if you've uh, taken our email fundraising optimization course, uh, you may have seen this email body template. It's right there on the right. And you can see it is pretty, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, a lot of copy, talked about that already, and not a lot of design elements, right? <clears throat> why is this the kind of template that we're suggesting? Uh, why should you be sending emails from a real person to a real person? Well, uh, three quick reasons. First one is this, uh, you can get more opens. It's the first step kind of when you send an email on that donor journey, right? You can get more opens. Here's a few experiments. So here we have the uh, organization versus just a person, Kent Lossman. Just the person increased uh, email opens 28%. Or in this case, there's a person and an organization versus just the person. Both come from Jacinta, one just dropped the organization. Just by dropping the organization helped increase opens 18%. Or in this case, this is actually from us. We've ran this twice. Uh, we've got Tim Kachuriak, founder, my boss. Uh, we just dropped the next after. And by just dropping next after, email opens uh, went up. Or having the organization decreased email opens and decreased click engagement. As soon as we see an organization, we're starting to think, I'm about to get marketed to. When we see a name, we feel like, oh, this is a you know communication, uh, a message that I might want to receive from a friend. So it's something to try. It's just send emails from a person and not an organization. It's one of the ways you might be able to get more opens. The other thing is you might be able to get more donations. <clears throat> so uh, here's an experiment. This is again with CaringBridge. You'll see their kind of fundraising email, pretty classic, header image, copy, button, sign off, PS, right? Pretty kind of standard best practice. And then the treatment version where we kind of removed some of those design elements in this case to try and make it maybe feel a little bit more personal. In this case, we saw a pretty big increase in clicks and a pretty big increase in donations by removing some of those design elements. So then there's another experiment where we kind of took that uh, email template and kind of stripped it down further. So on the left, you can see the same kind of thing, logo, personal button. And then on the right, we actually made a few changes, but one of them was the design elements. And in this case, it led to a further uh, increase in donations. So if I put these side by side and we can actually look a little bit closer, I think it's a really good example of what it means to send uh, real emails from real people. So first we kind of reduce the logo placement. Nothing says you're being marketed to like a huge logo right up top in an email. So we just said, let's just put that to the bottom. And what about buttons? I don't know about you, but my friends don't send me emails with big old buttons in them. They have links or often raw links. So we said, let's turn this link, uh, not in a button, but have it be a link. And then if you actually get into the copy, we did change the copy here. If you look at this, it's more personal and relevant. So on the left, the control, it says, when your world has been turned upside down, every connection counts, every bit of strength, every heart brought together. It's kind of this beautiful prose, 
but it's kind of talking at you versus on the treatment. I know you've been using caring bridge recently to stay connected to your loved ones. And I hope it's been a source of strength for you. That sounds a lot more like an email that I would get from a real person, doesn't it? But this kind of continues on through the email. So on the left or on the control, then it kind of launches into this story about Erica, whose six month old son Graham was diagnosed with serious cancer. So it starts getting at the value proposition through the story, but it's still not very participatory for the donor. It's still kind of, let me tell you what's going on versus the right. Right now we're in a short campaign to raise money to keep Cambridge there for you. And those like you need a safe, protected place to connect during life's most challenging times. It's a kind of a continuation and flow of this kind of email that is a little bit more participatory. It sounds more like a human. The other thing is that it's written to you. Just in these first two paragraphs, I'll highlight the times that you or your is used. Left once, right five times. You've been using, connected to your loved ones, strength for you, for you, those like you. We love seeing the word you in communications as people. So uh, that then it becomes, again, more participa participatory and conversational. So if you kind of add this all up, kind of what we change in the design, how we strengthen the tone, we talked more about you, it became more and more personal. And that's what really led to this huge increase in donations. Now you might be saying, but Brady, you're changing a lot of variables in there. It's not a clean test. Yes, we did change a lot of variables. There's a concept in testing called variable clusters. Uh, when there's more on that to come, this isn't a session on testing, but variable clusters is basically the hypothesis here is how do we, uh, will a more personal email increase donations? Now, if we only reduce the logo and kept everything else the same, then we're just testing logo placement. We're not testing if it's a personal email. So the common thread amongst reducing the logo, changing the tone is a more personal conversational style. That's actually the hypothesis. And in order to validate it, we need to change a few different variables. That's called a variable cluster. So uh, that's what we were trying to do here. And that's one example. So two ideas to try coming out of that. One, just remove design elements so it looks more like a personal email. And two, use copy and text that's more personal and about them. Try to use you like as much as possible in your fundraising emails and see what that does. And lastly, if more clicks and more donations or more opens and more donations weren't enough, you can also stand up from others. You know, your inbox, my inbox, our inboxes, they're crowded. They look something like this. And when we look at uh, how organizations are sending email, nonprofit recurring benchmark, 150 nonprofits, only one in five sent us a message in three months from an address representing a person. Most came from an organization, some from kind of a no reply. In Canada, uh, only 77% uh, of the emails we received were from an organization. And only 3% of the fundraising appeals looked and felt like that personal solicitation. So your email will look different and stand out from all the other organizations that are trying to also raise money from your donors. So the key concept here is that people give to people, not email marketing machines. Uh, this kind of approach of personalization is uh, covered at length in this online email fundraising optimization course you can get at nextafter.com slash email. So speaking of emails, uh, strategy number five, send emails when others aren't. Again, when we look at this crowded inbox, you go, how can we stand out from all the others? So sending from a person, being personal, tone and design, it's one way. What about just getting the open? Uh, how can you stand out from that? Um, or, or one strategy here from the Hall of Famer baseball player, we Willie Keller, just hit them where they ain't. Uh, what are other people doing? And let's do something different. That's, you know, they zig, you zag. This is this, what this strategy is. So when, uh, what days are organizations sending emails? So for a cut through the clutter study, we looked at all emails we received in our aggregate donor inbox from hundreds of organizations just in the month of December and charted it. This was back in 2013. You can see on the weekend, there's a pretty significant drop in email volume. And then we updated this study in 2016 and 2017. We'll update it again next year, both in Canada and the US. And we see the same trend, weekend volume low, weekend volume low, weekend volume low. So fewer and fewer organizations are sending emails on the weekends. So that's one way for you to stand out. We also saw this, we saw up to a 50% higher average gift on emails sent on the weekend. So now again, the goal here is donations. You may get a lower open rate because people aren't at work and you got a work email, not everyone likes to read all their emails uh, on the weekend. Maybe they save them for Monday, but there seems to be an ability for you to actually cut through a little bit more. People engage with what you're talking about 
and they're more likely to actually make a donation, maybe in the comfort of their home as opposed to the office. So it's definitely something worth trying and experimenting with. Just try sending a fundraising email on the weekend and see what that does. The other thing we can look at is when. So not just what days, but when in the day organizations sending emails. So here's kind of a heat map of both you know, days and times. And Tuesday to Friday from 7 a.m. to noon, these are kind of the heavy periods where most organizations are sending their emails. So what if you sent just a little bit before or a little bit after uh, when the times are a little bit, a little bit less busy? Maybe that's another way for you to kind of stand out. Uh, there's also a decent amount of research on the e-commerce side that shows that afternoons and evenings are a good time to target purchasers. Um, the, the motivation to donate is slightly different than purchase. So I would recommend try sending an email kind of later in the afternoon uh, as kind of a first step. You can also experiment with evening. It's tough because most people are on a mobile and donation conversion rates on mobile are kind of lower and tricky. Uh, but the idea here is most organizations are sending 7 a.m. to noon. Can you send a little earlier or a little later? See what that does for your donation rates. The, the key concept here is called contra-competitive timing. I first learned of it from a guy named Dan Zarella. Uh, he wrote a book called Science of Marketing, and he analyzed thousands and millions and billions of data points for social media primarily to come up with the idea that actually if you post on off times, you do have a better chance to have increased engagement. And we've seen elements of that with some of our uh, email fundraising. So that's the, the concept, contra-competitive timing. And you can apply it to your email fundraising and see how it goes. Uh, if you want to see more about the data and specifically dive into how you can cut through it year-end, there's a free study, Cut Through the Clutter, uh, nextafter.com slash C-Y-E, stands for calendar year N. All right, number six, uh, use non-ask content to prime your audience for an ask or a campaign. Uh, this is one of my favorite kind of examples because it starts getting into the world of online and offline and how we can use each to influence the other. So here's uh, first experiment, 7533, how targeting direct mail prospects with digital advertising affected direct mail revenue. So if you're sitting there being like, yeah, but we get most of our money from direct mail. Well, here you go. Here's an experiment for you. So in this case, it was with Hillsdale College, uh, the control group, they only received a direct mail letter. And the treatment group also saw branded uh, Facebook ads. Um, so we targeted those who were going to receive the direct mail. We sent them uh, branded Facebook ads. Those who just saw the ads, even if they didn't necessarily click the ads, they just were presented with them. They saw them in their feed at some point. Helped increase donations 239% and 150% increase in revenue. Now, critically, those ads were not asking uh, for a donation and they didn't have a link to a donation. They were branded ads, they were content ads, they weren't fundraising ads, all right? I'll still go back to that again. But just by showing branded ads helped increase revenue 150%. So that uh, led to this experiment, 8421. And this is one of my favorite ones because uh, we didn't run this one. <laughs> this was uh, someone who followed our work and buys into kind of our methodology and what we're doing, actually saw that experiment and thought to themselves, uh, I think we could do this. And so they did. <laughs> they ran the exact same experiment. They targeted direct mail people with branded ads, not with asks or links to donation. And they saw a 25% increase in revenue. They ended up spending about 600 or so dollars on Facebook ads and increased their direct mail revenue by $10,000. So pretty good return on kind of ad spend there and uh, kind of borrowed from learning. So if you think this is useful, just copy this and try it for yourself. And again, though, the ads did not have an ask or link to a donation. That's really critical when we get into this concept. So you can try targeting your direct mail recipients with online ads that don't have an ask. That's a way to influence online and offline. Or this experiment, so multi-channel multi cultivation. So it's kind of going the other way. In this case, we sent people a, a physical postcard in the mail. Uh, you can see kind of what it looked like on the right that uh, had a little message and then invited them to watch a video online. It's just pretty much saying thanks uh, from the president of the university. And uh, just the people who received that postcard increased uh, donations 204% just by receiving that thank you postcard before the email campaign that followed it. So that's another idea if you're looking, well, how do we boost online revenue with some offline? Try sending a thank you postcard before your online campaign. Or this last kind of example, how passive advertising impacts a subscriber's likelihood to give. Uh, this was done on Heritage Foundation, their blog, Daily Signal. And so they were able to actually split out users who did not read some of these um, specific impact-focused articles, like uh, how your donation makes a difference, your support is critical, uh, how the Daily Signal is having an impact, versus those who saw them. 
So people who saw these impact organizations or impact uh, content and people who didn't, they're able to actually split that out. The people who read or saw these blog posts uh, gave 196% more than those who didn't. Now, again, these articles weren't asking for a donation and they didn't have a link to a donation. They were communicating the impact of the gift, thinking that it will help influence the likelihood that someone gave often by email when they received the fundraising email. In this case, it was true. So maybe you don't have a blog with you know, millions of visits, but the idea is how can you create and communicate need and impact content without an ask leading up to an ask or a campaign? We have this temptation to think, well, if we're communicating need and impact, boom, let's hit them with an ask as well. And what we're saying is potentially there's value in just let you communicate need and impact and then let your ask kind of um, take advantage of the seed that you've planted later on. You don't have to do it all at once, all the time. The concept here is priming. So it's uh, a memory effect in which exposure to a stimulus influence response to a later stimulus. Basically, like I just mentioned, you're planting a seed now, and then you're going to kind of come back and touch on it uh, a little bit later. So a couple of key things here on priming, you can't do it too soon or too late. So the, the recommendation is kind of two or three weeks before. Again, you can't have an ask, otherwise it kind of defeats the point of priming. If you have an ask, then people, if they say no, they feel like they've already said no to the ask. So then your email that comes later, they're like, no, I've already made up my mind. Whereas if it's content, need, and no ask, they really haven't said no to a donation ask yet, but they've been primed to make it. And the content focuses on importance, appreciation, or personal fulfillment. These are key kind of uh, intrinsic motivators that people like and can harken back to uh, in this priming concept. So again, I'm just scratching the surface there, but uh, we cover those studies and priming in more detail in this webinar, Cultivate Your Donors Without Sending More Appeals. It's one of my favorite webinars uh, that we did this year, and uh, I didn't do any of it. So that's maybe why it was really good. <laughs> uh, but it's one of my favorites, so I encourage you to check that out if you're interested in this priming effect. All right, number seven, use confirmation pages and use them more strategically. So again, looking at 152 Canadian charities, only 48% of organizations used a confirmation page after we signed up for an email. So what is a confirmation page and why is it useful? So this is what an example, a decent example of what it looks like. So after I signed up for email, then you're presented with this page. Thank you for joining us. It's good on the user experience side. It kind of says, yes, you've signed up. Thank you. Uh, oftentimes the form will just flip back and you won't even know, like, did my email work? I don't even know. So there's a part of continuing the user experience, just letting them know, yes, you've signed up. Thank you for joining us. But then you can continue the engagement, right? They've just said, I'm interested in your work so much so that I'm willing to have you email me in my crowded inbox. Well, what else can you tell them about you, your organization? What is there something for them to do? In this case, read some stories, tell the world. You can continue the engagement and it's also useful for tracking and measuring. So if you're trying to run tests, if you're trying to figure out conversion rates, which sentences work, which sentences don't, you need to have it set up uh, to track somehow. And the easiest way to do that is you have a goal destination. It's this confirmation page URL. Put in your Google Analytics. I can even build these, so they're easy. I know you can. And then it allows you to analyze uh, where's traffic coming from? Um, who's more likely to sign up? What's the age demographics? You can actually start getting data based on what you're tracking. And then you can run experiments. So Google Optimize, free tool. You can pretty easily just split traffic and say, this is how I'm going to judge the winner by uh, email sign up. Boom, you're done. It's super easy, but you need to make sure you're tracking it. And this is one of the easiest ways to do that. So at first, this was like an idea to try. And then Nathan was kind of like, is this really an idea? It's like, no, this isn't an idea. Just, just do this. <laughs> add a confirmation page after information is collected. Email, donation, whatever it might be. Just add confirmation pages. Now, not only is it kind of, you know, useful for user experience and data and tracking and continue engagement, it also means you can try to do some kind of cool things when it comes to fundraising, like this experiment, where we were wondering, will asking people to pray before asking them to give inspire more generosity? So uh, Hurricane Florence had kind of ripped through the Carolinas, and in this case, the Billy Graham Evangelical Association had a call out to raise funds for di their disaster relief program. So that was the control and that was the treatment. You can see that the content and copy is pretty much the same. The big thing that was different was obviously on the control, we, uh, they had the ask for give now. And on the treatment, they just asked, you know, I will pray, will you pray? So if you click give now, then you're presented with the donation ask like this. And then if you click pray, you're presented with like a, a pledge to pray. So you'd name an email like, yes, I commit to pray. And then you'd get some emails to kind of help you join uh, and pray. 
But then after you said yes to pray, then you were presented with this donation ask. So said first, thanks for praying. And then it moved into an ask of, you know, praying is great, but will you also consider making a donation so that we can, you know, insert value impact statement here. By splitting out the actions and having pray first, then donation versus just donation helped increase donations 30%. Now it might seem weird, like you asked for prayer first and then you actually got more donations, but it's this concept of cognitive momentum that we'll talk about in a second. But how can you break up actions? Can you ask for a smaller commitment, like an email ask or maybe a one-time donation before asking for a larger commitment, like a donation or a recurring donation? Because once people are in motion, they're more likely to remain in motion. It's like cognitive momentum. It's kind of inertia. Once we start saying yes, we're more likely to keep saying yes. Uh, or as Como, as absolutely no one uh, calls cognitive memento. But maybe momentum. Maybe we can uh, start getting uh, hashtag Como going. Um, so cognitive momentum is, allows you to kind of split little actions and turn them into big actions, like uh, a pledge or an email or a petition into donation. This is actually where the idea of the instant donation page, one of the three types of donation pages that you need and that we cover in our course comes from, is cognitive momentum and donation after email acquisition. So you can learn more about that at uh, slash landing page, nextafter.com slash landing page, dive more into instant donation and cognitive momentum. All right, number eight, design with a purpose, not for beauty. So we've talked about kind of design and removing design, and you might think that we think that design is the devil. No, that's not true. We don't think design is the devil. When we look at this experiment, which could be viewed as design, no design, it's really not. If you remember, the focus was what are we trying to communicate, a more personal tone, a more personal vibe, and then the design influences that. It's not just design versus no design. It's what are we trying to communicate, more personal, more human, and design has a role in that you're designing with a purpose, not just for beauty or aesthetic or because your designer likes it or charity water does. There's a purpose behind why you design. So uh, here's an example of how the design of a donation page and value proposition, there's that word again, affect donor conversion. So this is gonna be one experiment and then we're gonna break down a lot of what we did to see how we ended up with the treatment because it ended up with 135 increase in donations, 87% increase in average gift. And if you remember your F core metrics, from strategy number one, conversion rate and average gift are two of the variables. You multiply them together, you get a lot of revenue. So original treatment, what did we actually do to this page to, to increase the design, not just for beauty, but for purpose? So the first thing we did here is we looked at value proposition, little to no copy at all, right? Why would you give to that organization? There's nothing there for you. So let's add some of that in. <clears throat> then we looked at some of these distracting links. I'll talk about this in a second. Header links, let's get rid of them. Delayed giving options, you know, pledging and stuff like that. Not right now. We're here. We're focused on an online donation. It had a side-by-side -side form approach, right? So you kind of the left and then you got to go to the right. Uh, our eyes and brains hate this. We want to go straight down. We don't want to go up, down, and around. So we said, let's single, single file line here. Let's go linear. And then you can see that the donation buttons are actually relatively small. So we said, let's, let's make those big old buttons for kind of, you know, maybe older people with worse eyesight or kind of like chubbier people like me with thick thumbs. Uh, there you go. Got some big buttons for you to push. So then we said, well, it's still quite a few options. What if we just reduce the number of options? Simplicity. So there you go. Now you got three options. And then what if we pre-select one to kind of nudge people towards that? Now, if you do the pre-selected, make sure you're nudging people towards something that is higher than your average online gift. Otherwise you're kind of nudging people to actually give less than what on average they would give. So there's a pre-selected default in there as well. Then we've got into the collection. So we required phone, which can be kind of evasive and, and really limit conversion rate. And there was a couple unnecessary fields. So uh, we made the phone optional. We kind of streamlined the form a little bit. And then in the last section here where the payment information goes, there wasn't anything that kind of reinforced how secure the page was. And then there was a CAPTCHA widget to prove that you weren't a robot. And so we just kind of eliminated that. We called it out to make sure people knew that it was safe and secure with some design elements. So when you add all that up again, it looks at huge increase in donations, average gift, gift and revenue. So again, this is how design can help influence purpose or in this case, conversion rate. So here's like a slew of ideas to try, right? You can try fewer gift array options. Well, simplicity help. Maybe try no gift array. We didn't actually do that here, but we've seen for organizations that have a high average gift or a repeat or a high repeat donor rate, sometimes not having any array at all 
actually leads to more conversion and a higher average gift. So maybe you could try that. Or maybe try that on a, on a repeat donor campaign or something like that. Could you pre-select an amount? Remember, you got to make sure it's larger than your average gift. Maybe bigger gift array buttons can help people. Uh, can you add a security reinforcement to kind of shade the credit card and put a little lockbox right where the credit card information goes so people know their information is secure? Can you move to a more linear, straight up and down low and fly out layout? And can you try making the phone optional? These are all some ideas for you to try and use kind of design elements to improve the performance of your donation page. Um, those are elements that we've learned kind of move the needle when it comes to online donations. Um, we actually built a template around it and we actually built an interactive version of it last year. I don't know how much we actually promoted it, but you can see it there on the right where you can actually go through, I think there's 19 elements on the general donation page. You can highlight them and see the experiments that kind of back up why we say to do this or not. You can also just download a PDF version of it and, and see all the experiments and what you can change and test. So you can get that at nextafter.com uh, slash interactive donation if you want to kind of dive deeper in donation page design. All right, two quick ones, then we'll get to questions. Uh, remove unnecessary distraction and links from landing pages and emails. This is pretty simple, but you'd be surprised at how few times we saw this. 75% of organizations in the Canadian study had navigational elements and distracting links um, and 46% uh, had multiple calls to action, so not donate, on the donation page. So this is a very extreme example, but we see stuff like this. Look at all these decisions and other things, you know, this fund, that fund, this way, that way. And I was just like, man, I just, I click donate and now I have all these decisions. And then look at all these distractions. Link, 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 link. Donate again, you're on the donate page. You go down, more links and distractions, get an email, share on social, more navigation. You don't want them to do any of this stuff. They've already clicked donate, move them towards donate, get rid of this stuff. It's one of the easiest ways to improve and optimize your donation page performance. The worst part is that was step one of step two. So there's even more links and distractions and friction. It's probably in your template, but you, you gotta get rid of it because it's taking people away from something that they already said they wanted to do. For example, this case, just remove the top level navigation, 195% increase in donations. So can you remove the navigation elements on your donation page? Or in this case, we took out kind of other ways to give and pledging uh, and these kind of other links that would take people away, moved it. It also helped make it a little bit more linear instead of left and right, helped increase donations five and a half percent. So can you take away these other distracting links that take people away from the donation page? It's one of the easiest ways to optimize your donation page because it reduces friction. There's different types of friction, decision friction, form friction. It helps reduce decision friction without the distracting links. If you're wondering if your page has a lot of friction, we have a tool. Uh, you can make a donation to yourself, uh, check yes or no for these 20 different questions. It'll kind of give you a friction score and tell you some ways that you can improve so you can see uh, how well or not your donation page is when it comes to friction. And lastly, number 10, focus more on recurring giving. This goes back to being a little bit more philosophical, but it's hugely important. For reasons like this, the average new recurring donor will give two times more in their first year than a new one-time donor. That's from Sustainers and Focus. In the state of modern philanthropy found recurring donors were worth 5.4 times more than one-time donors over their lifetime. So lifetime value is a key concept here. Recurring donors are worth a lot more in a year and over their lifetime. And yet, when we looked at 115 nonprofits in the US, some of the biggest and best nonprofits, to be honest, we found that only one of 11 organizations had that value proposition or tried to answer that question, why should I give a recurring gift to you rather than a one-time gift or another organization or not at all? Only one in 11 tried to answer that really at all. It's just nine out of 115. So it doesn't need to be crazy. If you remember this example where you click donate and there's nothing or this from the ACLU. First, they have some copy and some content, some text about why you should give. And then they have this like pretty subtle one-liner just on the value of a recurring gift and trying to nudge you towards monthly. So it doesn't have to be, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs perhaps, but there needs to be something. So that's an idea to try. If you want to focus more on recurring giving, you got to give them a reason why they should make a recurring gift on your one-time donation page. And then the last uh, experiment, I think this is the last experiment. Um, how can you present the recurring opportunity in another way where it maybe makes more sense? So right when someone's about to complete a one-time transaction, uh, how can you present them with a recurring gift? So this is what it looked like on the left of so the donation page and on the right, 
right after they filled in their information, they chose their amount, they click donate. This would actually pop up. Say, before we process your gift, would you consider something? And then it would actually walk through the value proposition of a recurring gift. And then at the end, it'd have a suggested donation, 60% of what the one-time gift was, minimum $15. And we wouldn't show this to people who are giving you know, large gifts, like 5,000. Just for them, just say, thank you, madam, please. Thank you, <laughs> move on. But for everyone else, we would show this pop up. And it helped increase the number of recurring gifts 64%. And crucially, did not impact the likelihood of someone continuing on with a one-time gift. And it may seem counterintuitive, but again, our friend Como is coming in play here. They've said, I'm interested in giving to you. I want to give to you. Here's how much I'm going to give to you. Here's my private and secure information. And then right before they complete it, all we said is, hey, before you do that, would you consider this? You can actually make a bigger impact, give less today, get these other perks. Would you do that? And some people are like, yeah, sure, I will do that. And then a lot of other people are like, no, no thanks, and just move on with their day. So how can you have a recurring donation ask kind of later in the flow, whether it's through a pop-up like this and uh, while someone is completing a one-time transaction? So instead of, do I want to give one time or monthly, you let them start creating a one-time donation. And then once they're kind of more committed and you know a little bit more, then you present them with the option to make a recurring gift. That's a little bit more advanced idea, but I think it's super cool and something for you to try. Uh, you can learn more about what we learned about recurring giving from these 150 nonprofits at recurringgiving.com, this full study that we did with uh, salesforce.org. And there's also a benchmark yourself component. So you can give yourself a recurring gift or a one-time gift, check a few boxes, and you'll see how you compare to those organizations, uh, average gift and uh, gift array options, things like that. So uh, if you haven't typed in your questions, uh, please type them into that chat pane. We'll get to those in just a second. So uh, fire off your questions here. I just want to highlight a couple of things that we have coming up, um, not just because they're cool to me, but I think they're useful. So I've talked a lot about testing. Uh, there's 25 ideas in there for you to test. <clears throat> but one thing we've heard from you is how do you actually go about testing? So I know kind of maybe what to test, but why or how? And so John is kind of putting the finishing touches on an online testing and optimization course. I've already learned a lot just from seeing the drafts uh, that he has. So, you know, crafting hypothesis, predictive statements, and then you also get some cool 90s movies references like uh, the Mighty Ducks, Little Giants, and Sandlot. So that's coming soon. It'll be at courses.nextafter.com, but we'll send that out as well. Uh, I got the testing bug. So I, I bake cookies and I'm trying to see if, you know, thinner flat cookies are better than thick, thick stout cookies. Uh, and the verdict seems to be thin and flat case you're interested. Uh, and Nathan mentioned uh, the training workshops. This is something that uh, I'm really personally passionate about. You know, webinars are great. Uh, conferences are great. But I think there's a certain level of depth and detail that's really hard to get into in an hour here or an hour there. So to take a day off and dive deep on uh, donation pages or email or content and email acquisition uh, or testing eventually or kind of an introductory for all these concepts, I think are really, really valuable. And that's why we're trying to pilot them around the country, both Canada, a uh, couple in Europe and around the States. So check those out. And if we're not in your city and you're interested, like, please email me. Uh, we're interested in putting these on for as many people as we possibly can. Uh, so let me know. And then uh, please do participate in the benchmarks. Uh, if you're interested in seeing how you're doing or you just want to contribute to a, another data source, maybe a better data source to inform all nonprofits about how they're doing when it comes to online fundraising, that would be great of you and we would very much appreciate it. So again, you can do that nextafter.com slash benchmark. All right, so we got through it all. Hopefully your notepads are full, uh, you have ideas and uh, hopefully we can take some questions here. All right, uh, we have a ton of questions. There's, there's a lot of these here. I don't think we have time for all of them. So just, I'll say this right up front. If we don't get to your question right here on the live webinar, either Brady or myself will get back to you Hopefully this afternoon, we'll try to reply to all these uh, via an email if we don't talk about them right here. But we'll uh, use the remainder of our time to try to power through these. Uh, there's a bunch. Right off the top, this is one that was actually submitted before the webinar. Uh, we didn't quite cover this, but just generally, Brady, what do you think and how do you feel about Facebook's online donation platform and Facebook fundraising tools? Oh, <clears throat> there goes the rest of our question time. Um, so this is really interesting. So what I'd say is uh, two things, one on, on the donation side. So like um, using Facebook to take in one-time donations. Um, I think in the short term, it maybe sounds like a good idea, but you get isolated from the donor data. Um, 
if you get it, it takes a long time to get back. And so it's really hard to build a relationship with the donor. You maybe don't get any of their information, or if you do, it often takes a long time. Uh, or you have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get a little bit quicker. And then it's a different process. And so you may be able to get a couple more one-time gifts, maybe, but the lifetime value or the opportunity to build more of a relationship is really, really difficult. So uh, I don't suggest people use that. I suggest you use Facebook to provide content, engage people, uh, email acquisition, maybe make an ask to point to your donation page. It's slightly different, I think, in the peer-to-peer -peer world where uh, a lot of times that's kind of new revenue. So Facebook fundraisers, and what do people need to do to, to raise money in peer-to-peer? -peer? They need to create a page and invite their friends. And the experience is actually really easy and all their friends generally are already on Facebook. So you can push out and ask people to give and support you, whether it's your birthday or not. So that's one that I think is a, a potentially a better use case. You still wouldn't get a lot of the donor data. Peer-to-peer -peer donors typically don't retain at a high level kind of anyways. And so if it's easier for the users and the reality is people are just doing it, whether you want them to or not, uh, you know, the sheer volume and user base of something like that, I think is really interesting. So one time and recurring donations, probably just try to avoid it, but maybe it's a useful tool for peer-to-peer -to -peer, birthday fundraising, that kind of stuff. Cool. Great. Thank you so much, Brady. Um, Carrie, if you have more questions, more specific questions about that, feel free to send us. <laughs> we'll just, we'll send, send you our thoughts. Uh, another question from Carrie, this came in before the webinar through an email. So, Hey, if you uh, reply to uh, the emails we send you on leading up to the webinar, <laughs> you have a priority for the questions here. Uh, this one from Carrie as well. Do you have recommendations for a nonprofit that has a small budget, in this case, less than 50K, to start online fundraising? Uh, do I have a recommendation? Yeah. Where, where, where should this organization start? What should they focus yeah. on? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, one, get started. Sometimes there's a temptation to like, we got to wait until, you know, we have more budget or, you know, we have more of a following or something like that. But what I would say that the, the thing that we've seen move the needle for small organizations or large organizations when it comes to growing online revenue is the size and quality of your email list. So there can be a temptation like, hey, Facebook's free and cheap. Let's build a community around there. Uh, we haven't seen that work. <laughs> so I'd start investing in an email program, you know, an email delivery tool. Can you do a welcome series? How do you capture emails? Can you develop a content offer? Um, the path to revenue might be a little longer instead of, you know, just asking for donations, but that's how you actually grow a more sustainable, a solid fundraising program is really at this stage growing a larger, healthy, active email list. Um, and so that, that's where I'd say to invest. Um, you know, we actually have a course that kind of walks through how to use content to turn them into emails. And then how can you try to turn emails into donations? Because that works for small orgs and large orgs uh, the same. So that's, that's what I'd say in terms of getting started. As far as free tools go with that too, uh, if you're not already, Kara, you can look at the Google ad grant uh, and apply for that. Uh, it's basically $10,000 in free advertising through Google. Uh, so that's a good way to get started with uh, driving traffic. So that could be a way to, you know, yeah, boost the web traffic number and the, the, those three key metrics. And then you can look at how do you start converting those people into emails and donors. So that's something to check out. Let's see, uh, moving right along. Rebecca has a question about color. Have we tested, actually, she says, have y'all uh, have y'all tested any other colors for email acquisition forms other than red and green? But generally speaking, yeah, what are your thoughts on color as far as web design? Does that really play an important role in the optimization process and the donation process? What do you think? No, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the short answer. So uh, we don't really have a lot of answers to like red or green or blue uh, because we don't test it. <clears throat> and to be honest, it's a really low value test. Uh, and it really tells you nothing about the donors, right? So the biggest way to move the needle is how do you communicate value of what your donation is? If you're not communicating that, your blue could be pink or red, like it doesn't matter. It's the value proposition and the understanding of what their donation will do that matters most. And then the change of a button is really, really, really incremental. So potentially, if you've optimized your whole donation page and you get tons and tons and tons of traffic, there could be a little lift, you know, in button color or font size or something like that, that could make a significant difference. But I'd say that applies to like 1% of all nonprofits out there. For everyone else, I'd basically say it's not worth running a test on a button. It's an easy test. It's not a useful test. Spend your time elsewhere. One color test that I know we have run that actually saw a significant result, uh, it really doesn't have to do with the specific color. It has more to do with the design and getting your call to action to stand out of the page. So for instance, this test was uh, 
testing the color of the donate button in the navigation, where the control, everything in the navigation bar was purple. But in the treatment, we called out the donation button, I believe in green or some other color that just made it stand out so that people right away knew this is where your eye goes. You see the donate button and increase clicks and increase conversion. But again, it's not about green versus red versus white versus purple. It's about getting it to stand out. Yeah, it's a good point. And I, I mean, I would say the general principle is if you want someone to do it, it's in green. And if you don't want them to do it, it's in red, <laughs> right? Like green means go, red means stop. But I've seen uh, some people disprove that too. But so again, yeah, making things, th that's using design with purpose, right? It's not about the color. You're right. It's yeah. about calling it out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving along. We've got another question about email formats. Uh, I'm not sure about this one. Have, have you tested or have we tested email formats with specific age groups. I'm guessing what this is probably getting at, and maybe I'm being presumptuous here, but uh, you know, is a more designed, a more templated style of email better for say a millennial audience where a more personal one might be better for uh, Gen X or boomer generation? Have you seen anything like that? No, and actually we were just talking about this. Uh, I, was, I was going back and forth with um, someone on our client services team, like the two variables that I think we need to start looking at uh, deeper is device. Um, device data to see what changes when we isolate device and then maybe age, what changes kind of 35 and under 35 and over um, to kind of overlay that. It gets harder and harder to test. Uh, data integrity is tougher, volume is tougher. So what I would say is no, to my knowledge, we haven't specifically looked at that. Um, there's a huge assumption though that like younger people like the design and older people don't. Uh, I haven't seen that proven or disproven. So potentially it's interesting. I think the bigger thing would be um, the average age of an online donor is 67 years old and a young donor is really like 55. And so if you're really targeting 25 year olds, my question would be why? Um, they're not at a giving age. They're really transient. They change their emails. So I would try to build fundraising programs around like 55 year olds. And then in which case, uh, you know, this may be the more personal, less design works for them. Again, I think it would work well with younger millennials as well. But that is who we typically focus on because that's where the revenue is. And that's how you maximize revenue. It's focusing on them. Jumping down, down age streams for no reason, uh, I think, is a way to waste a, lot, waste a lot of time and money. For sure. Those are good thoughts. Uh, we're going to keep powering through some of these probably for the next uh, four or five minutes here. So uh, if your question has yet to be answered, we're going to try to get to it. So stay tuned. Uh, if you need to go, uh, again, we can try to respond to some of these in email as well. Uh, but stick with us. We'll keep rolling. Uh, if you send on a weekend, send an email on a weekend, does it matter if you send to a work address or a home email address? I mean, if you have the option, uh, I would suggest sending to a home address. Um, for, but the reality is, I mean, a lot of us check our work emails on the weekend. Um, so it, I, I, that would be an interesting thing. I think most programs, though, you kind of choose like a primary, and that's kind of the default primary. It would be pretty, depending on volume, too, it would be pretty tricky to like, well, this is a weekend email, so let's you know, change emails, it would be worth looking at, uh, you know, my guess, I don't have data, but my guess is that home emails would get read a little bit more. Um, but I think you would probably see a decline in open rates. But again, will the donation rate and the average gift uh, kind of outweigh the decrease in opens? So it's definitely worth looking at. And uh, I think this was from Jenna. Jenna, if you have the data and you have, you know, a large enough file to be able to test something like that, uh, let us know if you test it. We'd uh, mm -hmm. love to be interesting. Let's see. Here's a question from Thomas. How do you, and actually this was a conversation going on in the chat thread for a little bit, so it may be already answered, but Thomas is wondering, how do you actually target direct mail recipients on Facebook? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so like address and phone records, uh, Facebook can kind of triangulate um, who those people are. So uh, and, and email as well, right? So you upload like an email file and a phone number, and then it'll actually be able to say, um, you know, here's these people on Facebook. And so you say, show my emails to these people. Uh, that's basically how it works. They match up the emails to the people on Facebook and that's how you do it. So to run a good test, you know, you take your direct mail file, you'd randomize the split, you'd get half the people, and then you'd upload that list into Facebook and name it, you know, Facebook direct mail audience or something like that. Um, and then code them, you know, in your CRM or something like that, or have to do an export at the end and see, uh, the gifts and average gifts of these people that saw the Facebook ads. And, uh, you know, I worked at an organization where 
you know, talking about doing that, there's big red flags thrown that, hey, is this going to be a privacy violation? Uh, there's security concerns with this. Uh, it's, I mean, it's pretty safe. Uh, Facebook hashes all the data. They're not actually storing a record of your donor file or anything like that. So there shouldn't be too many concerns uh, on that front. That's something we're thinking about. Uh, next question from Amanda here. Uh, what are your thoughts on having long form copy on a mobile donation page? That's a great question. <clears throat> so in that donation page course, uh, we talk a little bit more about the difference between mobile. And uh, what our research suggests at least is what you would change is you would eliminate what we call like supporting elements. So maybe like a quote or a picture of uh, a, a book if you have a premium offer. Um, and then it would obviously be all linear. You wouldn't use any kind of right side, left side stuff. It'd be all linear, but you don't change the length of copy. Um, as long as it's mobile optimized, we will scroll up and down. We're fine. Like if you ever read online on your phone, you read long form blog articles all the time. Uh, what we won't do is pinch and zoom. So if you have like a, a non-optimized donation page that where people do have to pinch and zoom, if it's really long, then you are probably, you know, adding friction, but I'd say the pinch and zoom's the problem, not, not the copy length. Um, so you actually don't, because again, that's the reason why someone would donate. And so if you start cutting that, you start um, cutting out the reason why they should give. So we're fine to scroll. And again, this is where you need good copy. If it's crap copy, if it doesn't communicate value, then people won't read it. But if it's good, then uh, they will. Cool. Thanks, Brady. We still got uh, several people on that are, uh, I think, sticking around for these questions. So if you got time, we'll keep rolling here. Let's do it. Let's see who's next. Savannah has a question. Uh, actually, Savannah said that the uh, hashtag Como was already taken. Uh, hashtag Como is for Columbia, Missouri. So we uh, need to do some more hashtag research. <laughs> um, she also right. has a real question. Uh, <laughs> she says, do you have recommendations on donation page tools? Uh, in their case, her organization's case, she says they don't, or the tool that they currently use doesn't let them make all the, the specific types of changes that you were talking about. Yeah. Any thoughts there? I'm, I mean, it's a tough question because there's so many variables, like what type of fundraising do you do? You know, what's your budget? What's your CRM platform? You know, what's this? What's that? Um, so what I would say, that's partly why I mentioned the like remove distraction, because that generally isn't a part of your tool. Uh, you know, if it's like a form embed, then it's on you to change your website. Even if you can't change the form, you can often change the navigation elements and the copy leading up to it. So those are some easy changes. Um, I know for us, at least, uh, when it comes to tools, uh, we'll often, you know, recommend like, can you just build it yourself using Stripe uh, and a developer? Um, it's easier to do than it used to be, but I understand it's not uh, the easiest thing. Uh, and one that we often recommend is actually raise donors, uh, raisedonors.com. It's a really, really good form and it's really flexible and it's pretty affordable for the technology and allows you to do some testing. Um, so that's kind of the one that we uh, will often recommend for people if they're looking for a more out of the box tool and don't want to code something themselves. Yeah. And Savannah, if you have more specific questions about that, uh, we'd be happy to, to chat a little bit more. Um, talk about some other tools. You can Related also come to, to Neo and, and talk to a bunch of them. <laughs> True. Yeah, come to Neo Summit. Raise donors will almost certainly be there, uh, as well as uh, I think we had 18 platforms like that last year. We'll probably have more this year. So, great place to check them out and learn some great strategies on how to uh, use them effectively. Shameless nice plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, we work on the marketing and sales team. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Savannah says she is coming to Neo. So yeah. You hey can... There you sure. go. All right, let's keep rolling. Uh, there was another question. I forget who it was from, um, but it was just about platforms in general. Any specific web platforms uh, that we prefer? Uh, it's kind of a, a general question, but um, I would just throw out a couple you know, options here as far as like email platforms. Uh, MailChimp is a great tool, uh, probably one of the best. I mean, out of the box, it's free for a certain number of contacts and then you scale up from there. Um, that's the probably the best most flexible tool for a smaller organization or a smaller email file. Going up from there, we often uh, recommend HubSpot, but you know, a lot, of, a lot of these depend on what the specific needs are. Anything else you'd add there, Brady? Yeah, I think um, Unbounce is a really good tool. Um, like we use Unbounce all the time, not just for us personally as next after, but our clients for landing pages. So it, it's easy to use and easy to test. And especially if your, your uh, website is really hard to use, you can kind of get around that using like a subdomain and unbounce. So that's another tool. 
uh, that's worth looking at. I mean, WordPress is, you know, pretty ubiquitous. Uh, we use it. I think that's a great kind of uh, platform to create content and, you know, uh, blog and integrate with other things. And then, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, raise donors on the donation side. So those are a couple more pretty cost effective tools. Obviously, once you start getting, you know, more unique needs in upmarket, then uh, the products and tools change quite a bit. We still got a few questions here. We've got about 90 people still sticking around listening. So I'd say we keep powering through some of these questions. Uh, here's a question from, it's not a person, but a, an organization, Eco Justice. They're wondering. Hey, oh, Vancouver. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so they're wondering how can strip, like, how's it possible that stripping down the design and the template of an email can actually increase an open rate? Isn't it true that? you're not going to see the design until you've actually opened the email. Yeah, no, 100% correct. So when I gave the reasons about why uh, a person does person focused email, the reason why someone would open is the name, not an organization. And then the first snippet of code and the preview text, um, you know, shouldn't have like, view can't view this email in a browser, like click here. Those are the three main elements that if someone would open an email. And so you should personalize those with a person, uh, not an organization, and then um, you know the preview text, but you're absolutely correct. You won't see the design until you open it. So that's kind of like how to get an open with a personal approach, and then is how do you actually communicate your value proposition and get a donation once they open. So sorry if I didn't communicate that clearly, but um, I mean there are some tools where you get a preview and you can kind of see it on the right. You know, like Outlook I think does that, but uh, there's kind of a different thing. How do you get the open, and how do you get the click or the donation afterwards? Yeah. There's another element there too, uh, just with inboxing uh, that we've seen some some evidence of. You know, like if you're using mm. Gmail, uh, it's going to split your your emails into the main inbox, the promotions tab, social media updates. Uh, but if you have a less designed template, that means there's less code. Uh, the likelihood of your email your actually images. getting seen and put in the right inbox is going to be higher. So that could actually even if everything else is the same, so. Yeah, and, and just to build off that, even uh, we looked at that specifically for the recurring giving benchmark and customer service emails. So like autoresponders and thank you. And every one that was sent kind of like from a person with less design made its way into the inbox tab. Uh, every single one that we received, there wasn't a ton, I think there's only 17. So the vast majority are still sending kind of autoresponders or more design templates. And those get into the promotions or even spam folder. So there's a there's an issue of deliverability there as well, which we don't have tons of data on, but there's some indications that the more personal approach even helps more of your emails get delivered. Uh, Brady, here's a question from from Tim, and uh, this one kind of hits close to home because Brady and I are sort of in a fight about this with our own emails. Uh, but is there a time where it's right to send emails with graphics and branding <laughs> versus sending uh, plain text emails? Brady, what are your thoughts? <laughs> this is going to get real personal real soon. Um, so, I mean, the, the vast majority of our research is focused on fundraising emails, right? We're trying to move people to make a donation. And so they're appeal focused. Um, we haven't done a ton of testing, say, on newsletters or something where the, con where the goal isn't necessarily a donation. It's actually engagement or clicks to then read the content. Um, so I think there is an argument to be made that uh, newsletters could have a few more design elements because you're not trying to be super personal. You're just trying to present, hey, here's the latest content. Um, so like that's that's one area that you could look at maybe having a few more design elements. And then it's again, it's not necessarily design, no design. We've seen where a, a good supporting image helps increase the likelihood of someone making a donation. So a supporting image is generally smaller and it's offset within text. It's not like the big hero header image and it supports the copy. So it's not just like, oh, here's a beautiful countryside of rolling hills. Like who, who cares? That doesn't help support why I need to give. Whereas if you maybe talk about um, a recent hurricane or disaster and you have a supporting image of like destruction, that's an image that supports the copy uh, that could actually work well. It's just not like a huge image. And, you know, sometimes like videos and GIFs and we've seen those be kind of distractions. So there can be good imagery that supports and potentially newsletters are where you could have a little bit more design element, but uh, Nathan hates me and disagrees. <laughs> uh, I don't disagree. I just want to test our way there, Brady. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, we're, we're trying to figure this out too with our own emails, uh, even just in sending, you know, updates to all of you on, you know, latest blogs, you know, new podcast episodes, new webinars, we've all these different resources that we're trying to figure out. How do we best share this? Is that through a, you know, a, a very personal style email, or is that through a more designed newsletter? So you may, uh, well, hopefully you don't notice because you hopefully you're just getting one version 
Uh, but we're doing a lot of testing in that to see, you know, does adding headlines within an email affect clicks and engagement and conversion and that type of stuff. So, And uh, Courtney from our client services team is slacking me as I'm talking uh, to help out and says, uh, we have actually tested uh, images and supporting images and cultivation pieces. So non asks and have seen those perform better than the pure strip down. So that is something worth looking at. And we're going to continue to test that cultivation is a big focus of ours this year. And so we might see some small differences. Again, I think the principle of people give to people applies across the board. Uh, but in cultivation pieces, you could probably get away with being a little bit more marketing as opposed to the fundraising appeal. Yeah. So stay tuned. We'll have more tests, more ideas around that uh, later in the year for sure. If you and thanks, Courtney. Help, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Courtney, for the help. Uh, if you test something uh, similar, let us know. Log it in, in the research library. We can help you do that, but we'd love to see what you are learning as well. Um, okay, we're going to go in uh, power mode here and knock out these last three questions real quick. Uh, is there an ideal number of donate call to actions in an email that we would recommend? Uh, oh. That's another like longer discussion. Um, generally, generally though, it's like one. So um, uh, an often a mistake people make is they put the call to action and the link too early on. Again, similar to like the longer form copy, it's not about the length, it's about value proposition. If you haven't given people enough reason to make the decision whether or not they wanna make a donation, then they may just click the link and then abandon on the donation page. So often it's better to have like, have you answered this question on value proposition well enough then you can actually have the call to action. So you'll see in that body template too, for the most part, it's kind of copy, 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 one kind of call to action. Uh, I think there's an experimental library where we use like a bunch of links and did see a bit of a lift just on pure volume. You get more clicks that way. But I think generally speaking, um, you know, fewer links, one call to action um, uh, is, is generally preferred. Yeah. A uh, quick question here from Maria. You mentioned a resource related to cultivating donors without sending more appeals. Uh, she's wondering where she can find that. We will send a link uh, in the slides and on the webinar recap page later this evening. Uh, let's see, two more here. Is there a course on email drip feed campaign? Uh, we do have a course on email fundraising. It touches on that a little bit, but that's an area we're trying to uh, build on a little more content this year while doing some more research around it too. So again, stay tuned. And uh, let's see, very last question here from Rebecca. Is there a Facebook group or Slack community for Next After Fan Club? Uh, so we can <laughs> bounce, bounce around questions with other fundraisers. That's a great, uh, that's a great question. We have talked about, a little bit about creating a, a special Slack channel. I don't think it exists yet, but um, yeah. I'd, I'd be super open to it. And so we can have more of these conversations, you know, so uh, maybe email with some ideas if you want to be, you know, like the chair member of this fan club or something. Uh, I mean, shoot. If Rebecca, you could, you can kick off the fan club. You could be, yeah. If you want. Go ahead and no, start that, it. Uh, we'll jump on the bandwagon with you. Yeah. That would be great to get in more. Cause again, a lot of this is like, you know, some of it, I think we know a lot and we've proven a lot of it is like, we don't know. <laughs> and increasingly we're just, we're trying to build more of a community where people can share that because maybe you've proven something that is useful for us to test and vice versa. So I love that idea. If there's a way for us to pull it off, then uh, I'm all ears. For sure. Uh, she says yes with all capital letters and three S's. So I think we have our president of the next after fan club. And I think that's it for today. Brady, any final thoughts, any last things to share? No, I think that's it. I think, um, again, like these are ideas to test and then, you know, the course and uh, we'll have some more resources moving forward about like how and why to test. I think that's also really, really important. So um, hopefully you'll stick around. And then uh, again, we'd love you to help us build this benchmark where we can provide more data and insights to nonprofits. So um, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks so much. Take care. See you next month.